what's the earliest creative writing that you remember doing? Oh my goodness. I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I was a little girl and I remember watching, I loved The Never Ending Story um, and The Wizard of Oz. And I remember watching like my first, the first moment when I realized that this book that I adored was also a movie. And it was like magic to me, like to see something that had been a book, suddenly it's a film. And it, it was like, someone cast a spell on me and I wanted so bad to um, create something that, like that, to, to write something that turned into a movie. So I started writing what I consider like my version of these rewrites of films, of movies. And I wrote myself into them, um, imagined myself into them. And I, I kept a, a journal where I would write these screenplays. I weren't really screenplays. They were just like, um, I guess, you know, just kind of me um, describing these movies, how they would happen and how I would be in them. And I wrote myself writing Falcor, The Luck Dragon and The Never Ending Story. Um, and now I look back and I realize it was, a lot of it was, you know, not seeing myself in books, not seeing myself in film and not seeing books or movies or other media that, that had characters like me in them. And I wanted kind of to, to you know revise that um and so that was my first experience as um a writer per se <laughs> that is lovely that is so fun I mean you talked a little bit about characters I'm curious now um if you could think of kind of a character in uh literary uh, art or film uh that you wish was a real life person that could be your best friend that you had on speed dial who would that be? Who would be your person? Oh my God. So I'm going to go back to the never ending story. It would be Atreyu, the hero um, in the never ending story. In, in, that, um, in the film, I think Atreyu is portrayed, Atreyu is a boy. And when I was a kid, I wanted to be a boy. Um, and I think Atreyu nowadays if Atreyu existed, Atreyu would be genderqueer or non-binary, mm -hmm. would not necessarily be a boy per se, or not always a boy, but Atreyu would be this gendery, bendery hero that would be my best friend. That's, uh, that's awesome. Now, I wonder about your, some of your writing rituals. Now, do you have, do you have some kinds of rituals? Do you have like foods or something you have to have nearby? Do you have to you know, do you have habits like morning, evening? How do you, how do you, how do you write? Oh my goodness. Okay. So my ritual it's, um, I always write in the mornings. I only write in the evenings if I'm revising something. Um, but the creating itself, the, the writing happens, it always happens early morning. Um, and I do have rituals. I have to have coffee before I write anything. A lot of coffee. I, <laughs> will drink coffee throughout the day as I'm writing I will drink a lot of coffee um and my ritual has more to do with listening to the writing rather than the writing itself um I usually write like a sentence and listen to how it sounds before I write another sentence and then um after I have like a paragraph I record myself and listen to it and then edit as I go and so as when I have many paragraphs, like when I have um, an essay, I will record the entire essay into my phone, put on headphones and go for a walk or pace around my apartment and listen to it and listen to it and then return to the desk and keep writing. Um, and it's kind of a lot. <laughs> I can't do this when there are other people around. Um, I usually do this when I go to writing residencies a lot, when I'm working on major pieces or when I'm you know, working on chapters of a book um, where I will write and then record myself and then go for a walk and people will think I'm crazy because I'm listening to my own voice. Um, but, but I think part of it has to do with, I have to listen to how the work sounds um, and something, there's something about the rhythm and the musicality of, 
the voice that has to be on the page for me. It has to be, it, I want it not just to be a piece of writing. I want to hear it sing. Oh, I love that. The poet loved that. Oh, <laughs> that is so beautiful. Um, that's so interesting to me. It sounds like you are saying that you also edit as you're writing. And I was curious a little bit about your editing process. If it was something that you kind of wrote a lot and then you sat things down and then returned to them after some writers say they need to kind of cook a little bit, um, or if it's something that uh, you do as you go. Um, so once you have, you know, the bones of a thing assembled, once you have done that process of hearing yourself and making the, the sentences sing and you've collected everything, then what happens next? So for me, I, I, I like to always remember that there's a huge, huge difference between editing and revising. Mm. So for me, the editing, like line edits, um, is something that I can do right away. But I have to leave myself open to the possibility that the work will change. The work will always change and evolve depending on what the work needs. So even if I'm editing as I go, um, I do, after I finish, I put it, put it away, leave it, don't look at it for a, at least two weeks. And then I return to it with an open mind thinking that I don't, I don't actually know what the work requires, that the work will tell me. And I look to the work and, and the work will kind of, something will reveal itself to me, kind of um, discovering things about the work as I'm reading and as I'm writing. And then, um, so I read it again. And then I usually just take it apart, cut things, move things around, edit some more. But I, I return to it with an open mind, um, trying to be flexible. Even if I know, you know, in this draft, what the draft is, I feel like I go into it wanting to discover something else about the work, how to add layers, how to ex excavate and interrogate what I'm writing um, and look for meaning, other meaning, things that I didn't necessarily intend to write, but that kind of emerged on their own. That's, that's such great advice for, 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 for writers. And you say you don't get to teach all year round. And so I'm wondering what, you get out of what do you what do you get out of teaching um, or facilitating workshops as a writer, you know? And what what do you think makes a good writing workshop? Oh my goodness! I feel like I know this is cliche, but I do feel like whenever I'm teaching, um, I usually teach in the summer, that I definitely get a lot more from it than my students do. Yeah. Um, it it makes me think about my own work. And it makes me think about, um, it keeps me humble, um, to be very honest. It makes me think about my own work and it makes me interrogate my work and see it differently and always keeps me thinking about craft and keeps me focused on how to shape something and um, how to do the work that you don't necessarily think about right away. Um, when I'm thinking about writing sentences and um, setting and metaphor, I'm not necessarily thinking about going deeper, you know, as I'm writing until I return to it several times. Um, and so when I'm teaching, I have all those things, you know, I'm aware of all those things. And I think conversations with students, students who are writers, students who want to be writers and have that enthusiasm for writer for writing, um, they, they challenge me, right? Um, one of the things that I love about workshop is I, I want to prioritize um, each writer's voice when we're talking about their work, each writer's vision, rather than the workshop, you know, trying to tell a writer what they think the work should be. Um, and for me, that in itself, when you have a lot of different writers who are writing work that they, you know, that they actually care about and that have their, you know, they bring their own experiences, their own identities, their own cultures to the work and to the workshop, that can be a challenge. But I think once we go around and we have very honest conversations about what, you know, a student's vision is, what a writer's vision is, and um, once we've practiced actually considering that writer's vision and how to help that writer get the work to to um, what they envision and what they want it to be or what the work needs to be. I think putting our own biases and putting our own um, 
ideas about writing aside and seriously thinking about what that other writer wants, which may be very different from what we want for the work. I think that in itself helps me grow as a writer and I think it helps other writers grow. Um, what I necessarily would envision for someone's essay, for someone's piece is maybe not the same thing that they want to do, that they want to write. And the workshop becomes a, a space where you can talk about the things that you want to do and how to, you know, how to do that successfully and how to get a piece to where you want it to be rather than what everybody else wants it to be. Um, and I think in itself, even if, if, even if um, the piece that you're working on doesn't come out the way that you intended and doesn't come out to be the best work, I think the workshop experience itself can help you grow as a writer. So even if it doesn't happen right away and you don't necessarily see it as a product, you see it as a work in progress. So eventually what you learned in that workshop experience will help you in your other work and will help you return to that piece and, um, and get it to where the piece needs to be. Yeah. Well, that's lovely. Um, I really love your approach to workshop. That's just, um, it sounds very collaborative. Um, and I'm curious uh, with that being said, if you could think back um, to the best writing advice that you feel like you got, maybe it was in a workshop, maybe it was from a mentor or someone else that you met along the way. Um, what advice really helped you develop as a writer? And, and then what would be maybe a piece of advice that you could pass along to emerging writers? Thank you. Um, I was in a workshop in, at Breadloaf a few years ago with Antonia Nelson, mm -hmm. um, and it was a fiction workshop. And I remember be feeling like I was in a workshop with a group, that I think, I think they were all women and one man. And I remember feeling like everybody's, everybody was writing something similar. Everybody was writing something um, that was set in the real world that was um, either domestic fiction or political fiction about women. And it was very heteronormative. Um, and I think other than two of us, everyone else was white. And it felt like I did not fit in, you know, in that group. And I felt like a, like an outsider. Not only was I different, but my work was very different. Um, and I didn't, like, I didn't know that I actually, that, that anybody actually saw my work the way that I intended them to see it. And then Antonio Nelson had, it wasn't even really writing advice. It was more like seeing advice. Um, and she said, not just to me, but to all of us, she said, forget about what people are saying in the workshop but think about where the work fits in a historical context and who who are like your literary ancestors who are you writing in the tradition of if you're writing in the tradition of anyone else and we should all be thinking about that like who is this writer um writing in the tradition of is there a literary tradition um that you where you see yourself so it, it really got me to think about where I saw myself, where my work fit in and why I was even feeling like no one really understands what I'm trying to do. It's because I wasn't really writing with an audience of, you know, these writers in mind. I was writing for someone else. And I was, I started thinking about when I'm creating something to stop pandering to the dominant culture, not, you're not writing for them. You're writing for an, for an audience. For me, my audience was very specific. And so as soon as I started thinking about my audience, the work changed. I abandoned any illusions that I had that I was going to fit into some literary mainstream. Um, and it felt like I was writing in a way that was a lot more honest. I was having, my work was in conversation with very specific writers. My work was also in conversation with a very specific audience. And even though I was writing for this audience, I felt like I could still, because I'm writing for that audience, I can write in a way that's meaningful and in a way that's generous and in a way that's inclusive and in a way that feels like I'm having a conversation with my people. And yet it's not alienating any other readers who are not my intended audience. Those readers can also um, read the work and engage and create some meaning. And um, 
think about the work in a way that's also meaningful, but they just happen to not be my intended audience. But what changed in the work for me is that I, as soon as I was able to see my audience, it felt like I was having a conversation. I didn't have to explain things to anyone. I didn't have to pander to anyone. And because I was sure of my audience and because I was more confident in the writing, I think it opened, it opened up the world to me as a writer. Like it, it helped me see um, the kind of writer I, I really was. Sorry, that was a very long way of saying. Uh, so, so interesting. <laughs> it's such an interesting, um, it's such, it's such an interesting, I mean, it's the universal paradox too, right? It's ultimately the more you are yourself, the more interesting you are. The more completely yourself you are, the more interested other people will be, regardless of whether you're, you know, you're thinking about them. It's so interesting. Um, I, we have a couple more questions. Uh, oh, how about, um, you're in the middle of a move right now, but you have to be reading something. You you have a bedside table. What, what are you reading? What, who, who do you, who do you like to, who are you reading right now? Um, I, I just finished something a couple of days ago, actually. I read Caitlin Greenidge's Liberty. And I have to say that book is incredible. First of all, it's incredible. It's beautiful. Um, I, I read that book and as I turned pages, I kept having to stop and think, and, and I kept telling myself, damn, this is beautiful. And I, and then every time I turned pages, it just got even better. And I, throughout the whole book, I was saying, I wish I wrote this. I was so jealous. I was like, <laughs> this is the kind of reading experience I always want to have where, where I'm like, ah, oh, I wish I'd written this book. Um, so I don't know if you've, if you've heard about Liberty, but Liberty is about, um, it was inspired by the first um, Black American woman who was a doctor in New York, one of the earliest um, Black women doctors and her daughter. So it's kind of a historical novel and it's about um, being a Black woman during that time and not necessarily taking on the roles that everyone expects you to take on and what freedom actually meant for this character. But it also questions um, what freedom is when, you know, when, um, when you're a Black person in America, when you're um, a Black person who actually comes from a lot of privilege during that time, or what was considered a lot of privilege during that time because her mother was a doctor, um, because they had, you know, they were very comfortable, they had a lot of money. And do you even have the right to fall in love um, when everybody expects you to actually work for everyone else? Um, anyway, so it's kind of a love story, but it's really more, for me, it felt like a novel that celebrated Black love, Black womanhood, um, and freedom and what freedom actually is. Anyway, read that book, it's amazing. <laughs> Good. That's lovely. Okay, I have a last question that kind of, um, I guess, dovetails on freedom when we're able to freely move about and travel again. What's the place you want to go post COVID, or at least in the new version of living alongside COVID? Um, the first place I want to go, the first place I will go is Puerto Rico. Um, so okay. I I used to go to Puerto Rico every year, at least once a year, maybe two, three times. I usually spent summers there and I haven't been able to go since about a year after Hurricane Maria. Mm -hmm. And um, I just got married. So I wanted to take my spouse mm -hmm. and we're planning, we are planning as soon as we're, you know, in a post COVID world, we will be there and we'll spend a few weeks just traveling around the island. Mm -hmm. um, seeing the you know where I was born the places where I spent my summers but I also want to discover new hidden places Puerto Rico is very small and it's very beautiful and there are in such a small island there are places that are very very different from each other there are lots of different communities um and so I want to explore and find new nooks <laughs> <laughs> new neighborhoods, new communities, new places to eat. Um, I want to swim. <laughs> uh, that's going to be so beautiful. Oh, my goodness. 
Oh, thank you so much for your generosity of time with us today. It was so yeah, lovely so to learn um, more about you. It just makes me even more excited for June. Um, I know uh, our participants are just going to get so much out of working with you and we're just so grateful that you collaborated with us in this way. Yeah, it's also just so, I, having read your book, it's it's so interesting to put you, to see you and put your voice, <laughs> hear your voice. I can actually hear your voice now <laughs> in you, from your book. It's crazy. It's so uniquely yours. I can't, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>